That's good. Welcome back to the channel. We are out in the garden and we are drinking some lovely chocolate tea that Eric made for us with cream. That's really good actually. And we have to head into our high tunnel today. Unfortunately, we have a lot of snow kind of blocking the entrance. I usually like to keep it clear because I have soil in there. I need to get to my soil. It is time to start seeds. Seems like spring has gotten here a little bit early, so I'm anxious to get in there, but we've got to chisel out a path because we had all this wet, heavy snow and we were not able to keep it snow free. So that is what Eric and I are working on. I haven't been in here in a while. It smells like the garden. This door has seen some better days. I'm gonna have to get this little one by four and re-put this plastic on there and screw that back in. It's kind of ripping off. This greenhouse or this high tunnel really goes through the through the ringer being up here in Alaska with all this snow. But yeah, cool. It's really nice to be in here again. Let's get some stuff out of here. Cool. You're gonna use a uh, small one? Yeah, it's frozen. We like to use this high tunnel for a little bit of storage. We don't really store that much in here. Primarily, I store that soil out here for the springtime and it is frozen. So we do need to bring it inside in anticipation to plant our seeds soon because it takes a few days to thaw out in there. Wasn't too bad to get into here today. I thought it was gonna be a little bit worse. But now that we're in here, we are going to do something we've never done before. And that is put snow on our raised rows in our high tunnel. So you guys encourage me and I'm gonna do it this year. We have the snow just a few feet away and it is bone dry in here, super dry because it doesn't get any moisture in here unless we're hand watering like that in the summer. If you don't already know this, rain and snow offers a lot to the plants and the soil. In Oregon, I remember there would be nights where it was just dump i mean just totally dump for like 24 hours and you'd go out and you look at the garden and the plants would actually be bigger and more robust the next day so we're going to be utilizing that snow and bring it in here it's so funny she's like a before and after picture how much are you doing? Quite a bit? Yeah, a bit. Oh, yeah. See how I put like one mound right there? Yeah. But what's neat is you could like chisel, it'll be chiseling out a path to the garden gate. Is that why you're saying you want to fight somebody? What is that called that they have in karate? Staff, I think. Yeah, that's what it's called. Staff. What do you think? I'll start next time. Yes. Two down, one to go. This is looking good. It's gonna be awesome. Gotta move all this stuff though. All right, it looks good in here. We are going to also check our bees while we're outside. Oh Holy cow. Measure big, guys. That's a lot of bees. Well, it's, I don't blame them. It's they do what they gotta you know, do, right? Do you right? watch these ones, though? There's two that can out myself. Two of them are actually taking out the red ones. All three of our beehives are still alive 
and we just hit March. So I, I anticipate they'll be able to make it. I've been kind of watching them all winter and they've, they've done pretty well from what I can tell. We have opened just one hive on the top to check their candy board, which is just a bunch of extra sugar I left them. It was like 10 pounds each hive got in addition to some of their own honey. So this hive still looked good. They still had uh, sugar left. And then we're gonna check these two today, just barely. I don't wanna disrupt them too much. And we can see they're, they're still doing well because with all these warm temperatures, they're trying to come out and there's just a lot of them dead on the snow. I know it doesn't look good, but it is good because we know they're still alive. They're actually coming out right now and they're either bringing a dead bee with them doing some cleaning out or my guess is they're just coming out to go to the bathroom, check their surroundings. But unfortunately they just don't make it back into the hive because it's there's, there's still way too much snow in the ground and we are still in winter. We were cleaning out the entrance where the bees come out. We only have one entrance for them, so I have to keep it free of the snow. And then I also have to kind of keep it free of dead bees because they pile up at the bottom. So that's what I was doing. And we bungee everything down because of the storms in winter. So they're nice and secure. I'm gonna get this off and check this hive. This is our biggest hive. And they already look like they looked last year. They were like, just crazy active when we finally checked them, which I believe was April. This is just shavings that I have on top. This is called like a quilt box and it's what provides, it's kind of more for ventilation and moisture wicking for the hive. And it seems to work really well. This is our second year doing this, but this hive does appear to have all the sugar they need, or at least they have sugar left in there. I can see it with the flashlight. And I'm just gonna have to keep an eye on them. They have to make it at least two more months, probably about two more months with that sugar that they have in there. That's exciting stuff, huh? Alive and well. Right, on to the next five. Oh yeah, they're alive. Let me just like, they're doing great. And if they were not doing great, or if uh, we saw that they were running low on their sugar, we could just give them a little bit more sugar to make it so they make it through. We're inside for the day and we are going to be working on getting our seed rack set up just behind me. This is an area that we really like to start our seeds because the sun is really nice in this window. And so those seedlings get a lot of sunlight. The only problem is that we already have something here, which is where we store a lot of our canned food. This is a nice little shelf that Eric has built for us. Last year at this time, what we did was we moved it in front of this table we have in our kitchen but it did not work out that well at all. So we decided against that this year and we got crafty. We found some various spots in our kitchen that we could store our canned food. They're all crammed in everywhere, nooks and crannies. We have like 250 jars left. So we still have a lot of canned food. I'm pretty excited about that. We're gonna get started on the seed rack. A little bit of dust bunnies. Eyes. <laughs> Which were coming? Oh, I thought I was gonna go that way. It's okay. this one for sure. The ones on the bottom need two, is what it was, if I remember correctly. Like this could probably have one. Gosh, these magnets are strong. Nice. You put good ones, honey. Huh? Oh my gosh. Let's see. Whoa! Nice. So, so just that one towards just us. Just this one right here. Hey, let's just say we wait to swap that one out. Just those two for now. Sure. And then we'll go from there. 
This looks great. Unfortunately, we just have to wait until our soil is ready before I can start planting some seeds. making some soup today and we are using just lots of things that we have in our freezer some produce from last season I'm trying to kind of clean out the freezer so to speak since we are coming into our spring months we've got some leeks onions and celery in this stock pot just sauteing in some olive oil I'm gonna add some chicken stock and we're gonna be immersion blending that once it cooks for a while for a soup base While our soup's cooking, we are going to get started on some bread. Of course, we have to have some bread for this. And we're making some sweet dinner rolls. It's a super easy recipe. I'm going to be using commercial yeast. This is instant yeast. So first off, I have to start with some water and our yeast. I'm gonna be using two and a quarter teaspoons or one packet of yeast if you pick one of those up. And then I've got a quarter cup of warm water I don't know the exact temperature. I usually just do like a little finger check. It's warm, it's not hot. If you do it too hot, it can kill the yeast. And that is no good. I'm just gonna give that a little stir and we're gonna wait until it gets a little bit foamy before we move on to our next step. It's been 10 minutes, our yeast is ready for some more of our ingredients. And I'm gonna be adding one cup of warm milk. I've already heated this. It is pretty much a little bit warmer than room temperature. So I'm gonna be adding this into here. And that's what gives dinner rolls such a like their texture, that, that sweet, fluffy texture. We're going to be using a nice spoonful of coconut oil, but you can definitely use a tablespoon of butter if you want to. Our next ingredient is salt, about one teaspoon. I'm gonna keep mixing that, and then I'm gonna add in two eggs. And because these are sweet dinner rolls, we cannot forget our sugar. You can use honey, or you can use sugar, and just a small amount, I'm probably gonna use about a tablespoon or so of this. And then we're gonna get this really mixed up before we add our flour. We're gonna be adding about four cups of flour, we'll see. And I am using all purpose today, but I would recommend using bread flour. It works so well, and I'm a big fan of bread flour. I just don't have any on hand. And I'm just adding one cup at a time to be able to tell how much flour I'm actually gonna need. And then I usually just turn it over on a surface that way I can start doing some of my kneading. It's gonna be a little more than that. We have to knead this bread for a few minutes and we'll kind of be able to tell when it gets more elastic that that's the point we wanna take it to. So I'm just gonna keep kind of moving it around until I know there's enough flour. All right, it's getting there. I know it's tempting to add more flour or add too much flour, shall I say, but if you just keep up with the dough and kind of work it and massage it, it will change its texture over time. It is, it's getting a little more elastic, but I still gotta keep going. She is ready. You can tell by how nice and soft the dough has become. And Eric was nice enough to get a little bowl ready for me. So we've got a bowl with a little bit of olive oil here. And we're gonna move this by the fire and let it double in size. It's probably gonna take about an hour or so. Okay, this is definitely ready to immerse and blend. I wanted to add some carrots to this as well. These are canned carrots from a year ago. And Eric and I are not a huge fan of canned carrots because they are very soft. So they work really well in soup. I usually add them at the end, but these are going to get blended. This is the perfect time to add our spices. We're gonna do salt, pepper, and just a whole bunch of herbs. I'm 
Now that the base is ready, we're gonna fry up some potatoes to add to this. This is it for our potatoes. This is the last that we have. That's why I have them outside exposed to the light. And you can see they're sprouting. This variety is really still pretty firm, so I can use this one. I'm just gonna knock off the sprouts and clean it. This one's really soft, probably because it has this huge sprout that it has shot off. So that's it, we did good on potatoes, but we actually are running low on them. We only have probably two weeks left. We're adding some frozen kale and the fried potatoes to our soup. Then I'm gonna be transferring it to our wood stove. And then I think our bread is ready to get going. Our dough is done proofing or rising. I think it took a little bit over an hour and you can tell by a, like a finger test if you poke it and if it springs back slowly, just like this one, you're good to go. And that's exactly how this one's doing it. So this is definitely ready for the next stage, which is shaping our little rolls. I'm gonna get it rolled out onto the surface. I need a little bit of flour and I'm just gonna be ripping some chunks off. Not quite sure how many rolls I'm gonna get. I've got eight rolls. Sometimes I usually do that with a knife so I'll get these nice even little slices or sections of dough. And then I just kind of roll it into a ball. We have to keep in mind that they're gonna rise quite a bit more. So I'm making them a little bit smaller than I want them to be. They're gonna get a lot bigger. We have a cast iron here with some cornmeal at the bottom. I'm just gonna be placing them in there. Those look beautiful. We're gonna let these rise for about 25 minutes. We've got an egg wash on these rolls. They're going into the oven for 20 minutes at 375. Well, I think it's safe to say that we made large enough rolls. They look awesome. I think this recipe, you could definitely probably make 12 rolls. I think we made eight. And so Eric and I are gonna have lunch now and then we're gonna pick back up with some other stuff. We're moving right along to our garlic. This is all we have left and it's still quite a bit. Most of it's looking okay, but some of it is starting to get a little bit soft. Which will happen, it's six months old. So yeah. it's getting old. It's older garlic for sure. So we're gonna be sorting through them. We're gonna save a few of the nicer ones for eating, but most of it is gonna be preserved, right? Yeah, they're all actually pretty pretty good. They're still holding up. I don't think that we're gonna move through this garlic that fast though. If we were to just leave it like this, I think it probably wouldn't last much longer. Much longer, yeah. Six months is a long time for hard neck garlic, and that's the garlic that we grow. That's how I can tell the skin's like a- Below this round. Yeah, see like it's just not baggier, but. Yeah, it's baked. It's yeah, a, dry. It's shrunk up a little, I guess. Yeah, it's dry. And we're gonna be preserving this a way that I really enjoy because it makes using it really convenient. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna chop it up real fine. We're gonna put it in small mason jars and we're gonna cover it with olive oil and we're gonna freeze it. And that's it. It's delicious that way. And then it's really practical for us to get to. Oh yeah. Yeah. Ready to go. We have canned garlic in the past and fermented it. Mm -hmm. And fermented it was good. Canning it was also fine, but I think you lose a lot of the, the beneficial properties of the raw garlic. So how are they feeling? Good? These are... I like just keep feeling them to see if I want to save them up. I don't know how many I want to save. This was a really good year for us as far as our garlic harvest went. I mean, we I think it turned out really well. And I paid attention to the varieties, so... Speaking of which, the, the garlic's actually out there in the garden right now, buried under snow. I kind of forgot about that. <laughs> the miniature ones are adorable, huh? Look, look at that. You little garlic. What's going on with this one? I don't know what that is. That was like a single clove that decided not to...
Now the fun begins. Great. Yep. Where should we put the new guys in the new bowl? I don't think they'll all fit in there. And then I'll rinse them too. I don't mean to be rude, but I think I've done more than you. <laughs> I've done like 10. <laughs> You've done that like 110. <laughs> so it was going back to what I was saying. I like to get stuff done so it's done. No, you forget that not everyone's robots. Some people in this world have souls. <laughs> and Ariel. <laughs> I'm saying, can I work them? Can I work at my own pace? Yeah, they're hiring at the garlic factory in Gilroy, so. Okay. Can you get an application? Getting there. Those little rollers, they make it easier, but garlic peeling is no easy task. One more little round and we'll be able to rinse these off. These look great. Definitely gonna be an awesome finished product. I left them a little bit chunky because that's how I like them when I'm cooking with them. And to use these, it's super easy. You got the olive oil in there, you got the garlic, you just put a spoonful in the pan, you're good to go. Okay, into the freezer. They're nice looking. Last thing Eric and I wanted to get accomplished is some pickled eggs. We're making a small batch of pickled eggs. It's gonna be just over two dozen. Pickled eggs are super simple if you've never made them. It is just hard boiled eggs and a brine. And the brine is also very easy. We're gonna be making one quart of brine today for the amount of eggs we did. And the brine is one part water to one part vinegar. So I have two cups of water going into this pot and I'm going to be using two cups of white distilled vinegar. You can use different types of vinegars for this. And what we like to do is just add an extra little splash of vinegar into there. Perfect, so that's the base of the brine. And from here you can add pretty much whatever you want as far as the spices go. We're gonna be adding a little bit of sugar. We like to add a little bit of sweetness to our brine. Probably gonna add about two tablespoons. And then in go a bunch of other little spices. We've got coriander, I've got some celery seed, we're gonna be doing dill and black peppercorn. We're also gonna be adding some salt. Eric usually does about a tablespoon per quart of water. We're gonna get this on the stove and then I have one more ingredient to add.
There we go, the brine's complete. And our eggs are done. We have to let them cool for a while before we get them peeled. We're grabbing some onions for our recipe. And I grabbed a shallot and I'm gonna grab one of these yellow onions. This is all the onions Eric and I have left, so not very much at all. I finished peeling the eggs and now I'm gonna hand this over to Eric who is the master at making pickled eggs. That's a thing of beauty right there. We're gonna let these sit on our back countertop for a few weeks before we eat them. We are excited for these. Our chickens have picked up laying pretty early this year. I assume it is because of the warmer weather we've been having. So we already have an abundance of eggs right now, which is pretty awesome. If you remember, we stored a lot for this winter in anticipation of not having eggs. We stored them in a calcium hydroxide solution that was new to us and that worked out really well. We liked that for the most part. They're not like a fresh egg, but they're still they're still pretty good for baking and things like that. And it also was really awesome for our dogs because our dogs do get eggs daily, but in the winter we have to cut them back. So this winter they actually still got eggs daily. We also pickled a bunch of them, 350 to be exact. And from now on we have decided we're gonna be doing small batches. The main reason for that is when we pickled that many, I had to save up those eggs for quite some time, probably about two months. And I believe that that is the main problem I had with the texture. So our eggs ended up being a little bit soft and usually pickled eggs should not be soft like that. They should be nice and firm and a good texture. So from here on out, we're doing small batches just like this one. You can also keep those in a refrigerator if you want. In our experience, pickled eggs last a really long time. I think the most important part is to use hot brine over the eggs and seal them quickly. I'm hoping that tomorrow our soil is thawed out and we can start some seeds. Right, our soil is finally ready for planting. It is super nice and light and fluffy this year. We have been making our own soil mixture for two years now and I love it. It definitely cuts down on costs for us before I was buying quite a few bags of potting soil and this just works so much better. I'm a big fan of compost so we have this mixed up with quite a bit of horse manure, some of our own compost pile and then I usually buy a bag of perlite and coconut core. That just kind of helps really lighten it up. And I think I also probably have a bag of potting soil in there. And usually I'll buy one of those in organic blend because it has some fertilizers in there. This year we made three totes full of this soil. So I think we should be off to a good start. And I have already started planting some of our seeds, but we have more to do today. This is a 72 cell tray. This is probably one of my favorite sizes. It's a little bit big for seed starting, 
but I like it because I don't have to transplant up that many times since they're, the cells are so big. And usually when I'm starting seeds, I will start multiples in one little cell. I don't really do that much special beyond just washing these out at the end of the season. I don't sterilize them or anything like that. Clearly I have compost in this soil, so it is not sterile soil, but I haven't found that to be too much of an issue when I'm starting seeds. I usually like to just grab like a shovel full and I'll just start piling it in. And then I just kind of push. I make sure there's no big clumps. Sometimes we end up with rocks too, or sticks. I'll just pull those out. Just kind of push it into each cell. And at this point, what I do is I'll like poke my fingers in the cells just to kind of compact that soil a little bit more. It's really light, fluffy soil, so I am trying to just get it packed in there just a little bit. All right, we're just gonna smooth it out on top, and that looks that looks good to me. I don't wanna pack it in too much because I'm gonna be adding a little more soil once we sow some seeds in there. Eric and I start a lot of our plants. I mean, in fact, we'd start all of them pretty much, like 99.9%. .9%. And I'm not really that finicky about the type of soil we're using, except for I do want it to provide nutrients for the plants. So that's why I like the compost and a little bit of fertilizers in there. Another big thing is drainage. It is pretty challenging for me to start seeds inside not just of the space issues, but also with humidity and just keeping them well watered without overwatering them too much or them drying out being in the sun where we, where we set up our seeds. So what I've kind of learned is to have a really light soil like this. That way when I water it, I'm not overwatering it and it does dry out fairly quickly. It works really well for us. It's just a little bit challenging with our wood stove in here keeping the house so hot, which is great for the seeds, but it does dry out things quite a bit. All right, this one's all ready. Today is March 8th and we are going to be starting with our onion seeds. I have already planted quite a bit of onions and leeks and shallots. When I say onions, I'm always including those because those are in my must list as well. Eric and I are big fans of onions and garlic. In fact, in my opinion, I could just never have enough of them. We're running a little short on our onions now too. And it's just one of those things we never quite have enough carryover. This is my first main big planting. I usually get started in the first week of March and this is our fourth year doing it. My timing has shifted a little bit, but I'm pretty confident with this being the best time for me with the resources we have available. And that's because we can't get our plants out if we have snow on the ground still. So even if we do have like a warmer spring and things break up sooner, I can't count on that. Otherwise I'm gonna have really big plants and you know, if something backfires and the snow doesn't melt, I won't have anywhere to put them. So that is why I always start pretty much spot on the first week in March. It's mainly onions and celery that need to be started, but there's a few other little guys that I'm gonna be working on or that I have already started. This little book I bought the first year we moved here, and it's a really good little guide if you live in Alaska. I mean, I like it. It's pretty helpful. I don't stick to it perfectly, but I do really like it and I think it's useful. Altogether, we're planting about 15 varieties of onions and leeks and shallots. I know that it may seem like a lot. I had ordered a handful of seeds. Actually, I ordered quite a bit because I'm I kind of love seeds, but there were some of you that were very kind to actually send me some onion seeds. In fact, I have one from all the way around the world. Very excited to try this. So onion seed, as you know, or you may not know, is not really very reliable for germinating after year two. That's why I'm gonna be planting a lot of these varieties this year, and I'm just gonna save a little bit for next year and we'll see how it works out. When it comes to onion varieties, there's one important thing to know, and that is the day length of the onion you're buying. So usually you can find that information when you're looking them up online, and it's short day, there's intermediate day, and then there's long day. We grow almost all long day onions, and that's because of our day length here. We have really long daylight in the summer. It makes sense for us. If you're in the south, you're probably going short day or maybe the, the middle or the intermediate day length. Okay, let's plant some onion seeds. First up is Alsa Craig. I like to call it Alicia Craig just for fun, and we're doing quite a few seeds per pod because they grow really well that way. And then at planting time, I have quite a few onions in one little cell. Eric and I are big fans of starting onions from seed. 
it's just the most economical, especially if you're planting like hundreds or thousands. Uh, next up, we're doing a red variety. I have red wing. I'm trying a blush onion. I haven't grown these in a few years. I'm gonna see how they do. I don't know if this will work with our daylight length. And then we have that really cool variety. Everyone's got different methods for planting and sometimes I even switch it up myself, but I found this works pretty well. I tend to not plant our seeds deep enough. So when they pop up, they still have the little seedling attached or the little seed attached to the plant, but it's not a huge deal. I'm just gonna make sure that I plant these deep enough this time. So I'm pushing them in and then I'm gonna be adding a little bit of soil on top and we're gonna get everything watered. Okay, this tray is done and these are well watered. I like the first watering to be a nice good one. So I can tell by how heavy it is too and it's not it's not dripping out. So this is perfect. We're going to get this moved over to our seed rack. As you can see, we have a lot of our onions and I'm even going to have to put them into a second row. And then I like to just put a little bit of cling wrap just lightly over. It doesn't have to actually cling to the tray. It just keeps it moist and it helps with the germination. These are onions, so they don't really need any extra heat or anything like that. Herbs are another thing that we like to start early because a lot of them are super slow growing. I wanna get a jump start on that. I've started a lot of our, like the woodsy herbs, like thyme, oregano, and sage. And sage actually grows pretty quick, but I do usually start it early. Oregano and thyme are quite a bit slower. And then I also have some lemon balm and creeping thyme. Creeping thyme does overwinter here. So does lemon balm. Pretty cool because almost none of our other herbs overwinter there. We have chives that overwinter successfully every year and mint, generally speaking, usually comes back. We have a few oregano plants that do come back, but they put so much of their energy into that, you know, having to perennialize over winter and then their growth next year that we really don't get to harvest from them. So that is why I am planting some more oregano. We've got some Greek oregano and then I'm also doing some winter savory. We've grown summer savory. I wasn't a big fan of it, so I'm gonna try winter savory. If you've never grown lemon balm from seed, it is actually a little bit finicky. I have kind of figured out that it likes dry soil. So it doesn't really like to be overwatered. And once you get a plant going, they will winterize and they're very invasive or can be invasive, but it's a really awesome plant to have. We're moving right along to our celery and I've got a little bit of bigger pods here. And that's intentional because I'm gonna be planting a few other things. I've got some artichokes and some rhubarb seeds we're starting. I'm betting on it being a warm year. Who knows, I could be wrong. I'm really not good at predicting the weather. Artichokes, we just don't have enough time to grow them. And really you should be starting these in January. So I'm a little bit late this year. I tried them once, they barely got to the flowering stage. I'm not looking to har harvest them. I'm just looking for them to flower because they have this electric purple color and the bees love them. My favorite celery is tango. I know Utah is a really common one. It just takes, I don't know if I wanna say it takes longer. It just usually ends up being a little bit smaller, a little bit thinner of a stalk. Whereas this tango one blows me away every time. Didn't realize I was low on seed. So we may be, we may be planting a lot of the Utah this year. And it's really small seed and I just scatter quite a bit in each pod because I will be thinning them out as they grow. Celery is actually really easy to start from seed. You just wanna start it really early because it does have a very long growing time. It likes a long cool season, works out perfect for Alaska. In my opinion though, it is a very high demanding plant once you get it going. It likes a lot of fertilizer and it does like a lot of water. We started two of these rhubarb plants from seed last year and they did wonderful their first year. I'm hoping that they overwintered. I think they did. I didn't know we were gonna like rhubarb as much as we, we did or do, shall I say. Um, in fact, I probably could have harvested from one of our plants. It was huge, but you really wanna wait that first year. You don't wanna harvest from them. You wanna wait until they're two or more years old. So we're gonna get a few more planted because I think it's something we're gonna like a lot of. And the celery seed is so small, so we're just gonna scatter just a tiny bit of soil on top of it, not too much. 
and the other ones are bigger so they went in a little bit deeper we're going to plant more put more soil on top of those something important to note is to make sure you choose kind of the right size pot for your seeds because they have to have really good drainage you don't really want to put them in too big of a pot to start with even if you know you're going to have to transplant them up you want them to be in a smaller container and then as they grow roots to fill that you then at that point move them up and that is why I'm starting with such big pods for these because the celery grow really quick. There's a lot of them in there, so they have a lot of roots. And then the artichokes and the rhubarb are also big, big seeds with big roots. The last thing we're planting today is some flowers. And flowers are something that we started kind of growing back in Oregon. I've been working on it here. We've been growing vegetables a lot longer, so those come a little bit more natural to me. I understand their needs a little bit better. I found that flowers are very similar in that sense, that each flower has certain needs and things like growing requirements that they like. So for me personally, it's helpful to look up the varieties that I'm growing and just jot down what that certain flower needs. It's really common for a lot of flowers to need to go through a process called cold stratification. And basically what that means is the seed was designed to be outside for a winter before they germinated, you know, the way it would work in the natural world, the plant would flower and let the spread the seeds out on the ground. They'd go through winter and they germinate the next year. So we're kind of mimicking that when we do that process. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I kind of like to do what's called moist stratification. So that's just where we subject the seed to cold and moisture. And then after a certain period, we bring it inside and we start the process of germination. We've already got some of our flowers outside working on that process. I'm starting it a little bit late. You'd wanna start this a little bit earlier to account for that, that period. The first thing I'm doing is some mullen. It's new to me this year. And I'm just gonna be putting a little bit of the seed in a paper towel. And then what we're gonna do is just fold the paper towel over on top of itself, kind of make like a little envelope and just add a teeny tiny bit of water to this. And I'm just looking to just get it soaked, not like dripping or anything like that. So that looks, that looks good to me. And you can put these in your fridge, but I'm going to be utilizing the Alaskan weather. I'm going to be putting these outside. Got some more flowers going in here. The ones I have outside, I've actually sewed in the soil and then I just put a little bit of cling wrap on top of them. So those ones will be a little bit easier once I bring them inside. These ones I'm gonna have to actually let them go through that period and then I'll put them on top of some soil and let them germinate. Another technique that works really well, I've done this too in the past, is you can literally take the flower seed and you can put it in your freezer or your fridge for that period and just not expose it to the moisture. Not all of them really need that moisture anyways. And that's just another easy way to do it. We've got some Texas blue bonnet that we're gonna try. I tried these last year and I was not successful. That can happen with flower seeds. They are a little bit tricky and I'm learning. I'm just gonna get them down there now. But with these seeds, because they are really, really hard coating, they have like a hard shell, you want to do a process of scarification that's gonna increase your chances of germination. It's the same thing as what I was talking about earlier, you're basically just mimicking what happens in nature. These seeds are meant to go through a few winters and kind of gradually break down. So you can use sandpaper or you can take some little clippers and you can actually nip just a teeny tiny part of them or nick them. And now that seed is scarified. We just broke off a little piece of the shell. And the point is just to nick the coating. You don't actually want to like gouge the seed. We're going to be bringing these outside. These next flower seeds do not need that period that we were just talking about. In fact, they're grouped together this way because they need a little bit of light to germinate. So I'm going to be sowing them very shallow. In fact, I'll just be scattering them on top of our soil. The question we get a lot is where do we like to buy our seeds from? And the truth is we've ordered from several companies over the years and I actually really like all of them. I really never had one that I was disappointed with. And I would encourage you to look and focus a little more on the variety of plant you're growing and those specific needs because they do vary a lot. Again, I'm just a big fan of a lot of the seed companies that we choose to grow from. All this planting has me very excited about spring. Let us know what you are excited about this year or something you've got grown in your garden.
staff. Ah! <laughs> That's evil. That's okay. a, we're doing our pre, you know the pre-show where they show off their moves and stuff? <laughs> we're not hitting yet. Show me your move. What's my move? I don't know. Get away from me though, we're not hitting yet. I'm trying to twirl it in here. Can you twirl it? That's really good, Eric. You hear it? It made the sound. 